Greetings. My name is Ben Dorman, and I am the co-editor of Asian Ethnology. Welcome to Asian Ethnology Podcast. My guest is Scott Schnell, Associate Professor of Anthropology at the University of Iowa. He studies such topics as ritual and performance, environment and ecology, politics and representation, and historical ethnography. Scott is also the former co-editor of Asian Ethnology. Hi, Scott. Hello. What attracted you to Japan in the first place? Well, uh, I usually give two answers to this question, and I choose one or the other depending on the audience, but I'll just give them straight to you, and uh, you can hash it out. But uh, one answer is that I was very interested in ecology, environmental studies, and I started reading Asian philosophy, and I thought there was a parallel there. And so I thought, oh, people in Japan must be really cool about the environment, so I need to go there and pick up on that. Of course, that's a very naive point of view, and I found out when I first got here that I was somewhat misinformed, but that piqued my interest along with the fact that I was training in karate, uh, very interested in karate. So those two reasons really brought me to Japan, and then I decided to study Japanese um, so that I could be more effective in interacting in Japan, and that really put the hook in me, the language study. And I kept going with that and just get pulled deeper and deeper into Japan and Japanese culture and history and so forth. And that was the beginning. Okay, so environmental issues play a fairly important part in your research here. Yes, you know, uh, you know, way back when, when I was an undergraduate, I was, my major was environmental studies. And I look back at that time and I look at myself now, my interests really haven't changed that much. Even though back then I had no inkling that I was come, going to come to Japan and spend so much time doing field work here. But um, basically I'm interested in the environment and people's conceptualization of the environment and how that is played out through belief and ritual or what we would call religion. Okay. So you've written that your interests um, have consistently led you away from coastal plains and into the forested mountain interior. Is this still the case? And why do you think it happened this way? It's still the case because I'm naturally drawn to the mountains. I grew up in an area that didn't have mountains, and so I feel myself as sort of mountain-deprived, mountain deficit syndrome. <laughs> so I just naturally inclined toward the mountains, but also because uh, mountainous areas have been less well-researched by anthropologists. And I recognized that there was a different kind of lifestyle going on there and that that, too, had to be represented. Um, you know, there was a lot of emphasis in ecological studies on rice production. Well, you get to a certain elevation and a certain ruggedness of terrain, you can't really grow rice very successfully. So what were people doing there to survive? Um, and so my work has tried to give a voice to people who really haven't been very well represented, mountain-dwelling people among them. Okay. So... You conducted ethnographic uh, field work in the town of Furukawa. That's right. Um, uh, which is in, uh, in Gifu Prefecture um, in central Japan. And then you published a book uh, entitled The Rousing Drum, uh, Ritual Practice in a Japanese Community, which was published by University of Hawaii Press in 1999. So um, what I'd like to ask you is what's the significance of the word rousing in the title? Hmm. You know, we were just up there a couple of weeks ago. Uh, April 19th is the night of the Okoshi Daiko, or I translated it, rousing drum. Uh, and it's an interesting history. Um, it evolved over time from this little preliminary drum ritual. It was sort of like the drum, I think they call it a fure daiko, that goes around town before a sumo tournament starts, just to alert people that the tournament is about to begin. So um, it was also called mezamashi daiko, and a mezamashi is just a wake-up call, right? But the name changed to okoshi daiko, and I think that's significant, because mm. okosu can mean to rouse you from sleep, but it also can mean to rouse people to rebel. And so that's where the title became very significant to me and why I chose to translate it rousing drum, because rousing has the same double meaning. Right. I'm interested in, in your work because it's like you, you explore anthropology and history 
you kind of work the two together in in your research. You yeah. Know? And so I wanted to ask you, when did that change occur? Like the change of the name. Well, I just sort of had to go where my informants were leading me. We call them informants in anthropology. Okay. Uh, advisors might be a better word, or mm. friends, mm -hmm. simply <laughs> people who are willing to talk to you and teach you what's going on. Mm. And uh, I was picking these things up from them. I had in my mind to do more of an ecological study at the time because my interests lied in that direction. But what I found out through my field work is this political dimension that really needed to be addressed. Mm. At the time, people were writing about about Matsuri, Shinto Shrine Festivals, mm. in very much a communal harmony type model, but I was seeing this unruly, uh, boisterous side, and I thought that was very interesting and needed to be represented as well. So I began to look at the historical developments, figuring that um, this has probably changed over time. I should say, I'm, I'm I'm more interested in ritual than in Matsuri per se, Japanese festivals per se. It's the ritual aspect that I found interesting. And uh, my thinking was that ritual isn't just stereotyped repetitive behavior. It changes over time and it adapts or is adapted to uh, current situation, current conditions, changing needs. And so I was interested in how the historical development happened, especially when I discovered again that this uh, rather um, sort of violent uh, drum procession began as uh, just a little drum going around town announcing the start of the festival. So how did it, how did it evolve into this whole different thing and really become the core, the heart and soul of the festival. Mm. And so I had to delve into the historical materials. I'm, I'm not trained as a historian, although I find, his, you know, I think the historical dimension is, is absolutely vital mm. because otherwise you get the misconception that, again, ritual is static. It's just repetitive behavior. It's a force of conservatism, if you will. But I was looking at it more as a dynamic thing. So how does it change over time? Yeah, so you didn't just delve into the records, you actually delved into the festival itself. There's a photo of you um, uh, participating in the violence. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's yeah. a photo that appeared in this <laughs> women's magazine called Fujin Gaho, uh -huh. and I didn't know it until about a year later when my friends passed me a copy of the issue. But yeah, mm. um, I, I participated uh, twice in a row. Mm -hmm. And you have to take out insurance to participate in the oh, festival because okay. people do get injured. It's a so-called Kenka Matsuri, or fighting oh. festival. Mm -hmm. um, that may be overdoing it. I should say also in, in, in contemporary times, the violence is pretty controlled. Okay. So um, there are injuries, but uh, not quite the same level as you know prior to the Second World War, for example. In 2006, Scott Schnell published some research in the journal Asian Folklore Studies, which was the predecessor to Asian Ethnology. The article explored the use of literature as a source of historical and ethnographic data and focused on the writer Emma Shu and his massive historical novel Yama no Tami, or The Mountain Folk. I asked Scott if he could tell us more about Emma Shu and his work. Well, he's a very interesting figure. Uh, he's not very well known, I think, because he was stubborn and also rather obsessed with this one project. But for a time, he was a very popular author. Um, but he was disillusioned because of uh, the aftermath of the great Tokyo earthquake in 1923 and the police oppression of uh, Korean nationals living in Tokyo at the time and other you know this is leading up into the into the war experience and so he's seeing the militancy develop and he's really taking a strong stance against it um, becoming a dissident so he had actually been born and was raised in Hida Takayama okay. where um, the novel is placed. I should say also that this, this, this book, uh, Yama no Tami, is about a peasant rebellion that occurred in 1869. It's the uh, uh, Umemura Rebellion, where um, they rose up against this young governor, newly appointed by the Meiji government, and actually ended up 
killing him. Uh, well, they didn't kill him. They wounded him. He was put in prison and uh, died in prison later is what happened. But um, the author, Emma Nakasi, or Emma Shu as his, his pen, pen name, um, was uh, using this novel as an indirect way of criticizing his own government at the time. So he was being surveilled and oppressed by the special police in Tokyo. And so he decided to go underground, if you will. He moved back to Takayama and uh, sort of redefined himself as a folklorist. Or we would call him an ethnographer. And interestingly, he edited a journal uh, called Yamabito. Oh, that's right. And it ran for several years and was pretty highly regarded. And, uh, you know, a, a lot of prominent folklorists, Yanagida Kunio among them, contributed to that journal. Mm. So he was out in the mountains gathering data, historical, ethnographic, and especially focusing on this peasant rebellion and incorporating that directly into his novel and into um, some of the articles that he was writing under other pen names for the journal. He used about five or six different pen names uh, depending on the subject matter. Uh, so he's a very interesting character, very interesting person, and uh, again, not widely known, although literary critics do think pretty highly of his work. Okay. He wrote, rewrote that same novel four different times, <laughs> each striving for you know a, a better, more complete coverage, but also incorporating some of the new information he uncovered by doing field work. Mm -hmm. Then, especially after the Second World War, he could be more open and direct. And uh, what he does in the novel is make a connection between what's going on during the Meiji Restoration, including the oppression of Buddhism, and uh, you know the 1930s Japan leading into the war experience, and kind of hinting that um, that whole militarism began back during the early years of the Meiji period, and in a sense, uh, colonializing the Japanese countryside, mm -hmm. just like the government would later colonialize, you know, Manchuria, Taiwan, Korea. So uh, it, it's a it, it's the work of a dissident, and it's uh, a, a critique of militarism in disguised form. Another place, another time. Uh, because it's the only way he could write about it and get away with it. So he's really trained as a novelist, but he kind of retooled himself as a folklorist, ethnographer, and also historian. And he did a pretty good job of it. One other question um, I wanted to ask about Emma Shu. Have you uh, finished with that research, or are you continuing with that research? Well, my problem in, in doing field work is that I stumble upon really interesting topics and then I get misdirected. So <laughs> I was in the midst yeah. of this, uh, you know, novel as a source of historical and ethnographic data project mm -hmm. with Emma Shu or Emma Nakashi, the author. Uh, and through that, I kind of discovered, uh, you know, mountain oriented religious belief and practice, but also that um, the, the, the mountaineers and also religious uh, ascetics relied upon local hunters as guides. And these local hunters as guides start popping up in different places, uh, same people, but different places. And so they're moving around. And we were taught back in school that, oh, you know, people in villages, they're isolated and they stay put and they're sort of rooted in place because they're growing rice and they're kind of rooted in place like the rice plants themselves. And mm. you go from one valley to the next valley and there's no contact between them. And all that is wrong. <laughs> um, that through the activities of hunters and timber cutters and other people who live and work in the mountains, you know, there were interconnections and mountains aren't barriers to communication. They're conduits. Very interesting. Yeah. So huh. it really turned my head around. Right. 
And that's why I mean what I that, that's what I mean when I say you know the the people who lived and worked in the mountains weren't really well represented, okay. so they become intermediaries of a sort, mm-hmm. Interme- intermediaries between places, intermediaries between uh, you know earth and heaven, if you will, because it's very interesting. The rice farmers down in the lowlands would rely upon these hunters to offer prayers for them because where do you go to do, to do that? It's the summits of the mountains, like prayers for rain. And so the hunters become almost like shamans or some kind of religious practitioner. They would offer ritual prayers for rain on behalf of the farmers below, even though them, they themselves weren't directly benefiting. I thought mm. that was really interesting. Mm. So, um, and they seem to have a more intimate relationship with this Yama no Kami or mountain god, mountain deity, mountain spirit, such that they weren't living in fear. And also they w- would identify her as female which I thought was interesting because uh, in the lowlands, if you're growing rice, the Yama no Kami is something that comes down in the spring and becomes the Tano Kami, the god or spirit of the rice paddies, for the duration of the growing season and then goes back up into the mountains, but is identified as a male. Mm. Uh, so the mountain people recognize there's a Yama no Kami, a mountain spirit, a mountain god there, but it doesn't go anywhere. Why would it? It belongs in the mountains and what's more identified as female. But they have more of an intimate association and, and more of what I would call a, a sort of a trusting relationship. Whereas the lowlands image of the Yama no Kami is uh, sort of living in fear of its wrath, that it can bring destruction just as easily as um, rain uh, and uh, other resources that they need to survive. I found that was really interesting. Mm. So um, gradually I was drawn into the topic of the Matagi, who are usually described in English as traditional hunters, but it's a word that is used or used to be used exclusively in, in the Tohoku region, specifically Akitaken and Aomoriken, but has now become more of a general term for traditional hunter. I should also say that um, I'm not interested in the Matagi because they kill animals. It's because they have this special intimacy with the environment that is represented through their belief in the Yama no Kami. And uh, I, I found that they, they distinguish themselves from your typical hunter. In fact, when they're talking about uh, a sports hunter, they use the English loan word, hunta. But they never use that term in reference to themselves. I see. So mm. then the question mm. becomes, well, what is the difference? How do you distinguish matagi from hanta? And uh, that's where you get into this sense that, uh, well, you're talking about people who are highly knowledgeable uh, and in, in have this intimate association with their local area. And that is expressed through their veneration of the Yama no Kami or the mountain deity, mountain spirit. Uh, whereas recreational hunters are really just looking for uh, an adventure or a trophy. Um, to the Matagi, it's, it's very important, uh, first of all, to acknowledge that you are be, you're privileged to be in the mountains and uh, uh, that you are being bestowed with these gifts and that you should not abuse the privilege by taking more than you need. Also, it, you kill whatever you eat. If you're not going to eat it, then you have no business killing it. Whereas a sports hunter would might just be out for the the thrill of the pursuit and uh, maybe a trophy, uh, something like that. But I'm, I realize there's not a clear-cut, absolute distinction between the two categories. But in general terms, that's how I would distinguish them. Number one being that the Matagi recognize and revere the mountain spirit, the mountain god. And that, to me, sort of uh, percolates through their entire existence and 
in a way acts as a kind of rudimentary conservation ethic because if they abuse the privilege by taking too much, then they run the risk of incurring her wrath, which means less success in the future. And traditionally, they depended upon the mountains uh, for their sustenance. And so they were careful not to uh, abuse the privilege, not to betray that trust. Well, can you tell me a little bit about their lives? Like, do they, um, are they uh, people who go out in the mountains at certain times of, you know, on the weekends and so on. I'd like to learn a little bit more about that. Well, yeah, again, things change over time, and uh, people often ask me, well, do matagi still exist? Um, but it's a little bit similar to, like, in North America, if, if someone to, were to ask, are there still real cowboys out there? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, yes and no. Um, I guess there are people you could call cowboys, but they're driving pickup trucks and they're living in houses with TV and all the modern conveniences and so forth. That's sort of the way it is with the Matagi. They've all got other jobs. In fact, um, you know, it's it's no longer. They, it's true that they still believe in the ethic of eating what you kill. Otherwise, you have no business killing it. But they don't need to in order to survive. So then the question is, well, why do they persist? And that's one of the leading questions in my research. Why is it important to continue to uh, kill animals when you don't absolutely need that for your own subsistence? Uh, Bear in particular. I mean, they're kind of defined now as bear hunters, first and foremost. So this relationship with the bear, and a lot of animal rights people are upset about this and uh, really object to killing bears, especially when bears are seen as being somewhat uh, threatened. Uh, There's this idea that their numbers are declining, whether that's true or not, um, still seems to be a bit of an open question. But um, I want to clearly distinguish the Matagi, again, from your typical hunter, because again, they, uh, without the bear, their identity would be gone. And so they really depend upon the bears, the health of the bear population. But they also see that without their presence, without their activity, um, animal populations can become too numerous and uh, start threatening uh, other species, uh, vegetation, whatever. What I found through my research is that, um, you know, you can take a stance that it's, it's, we want to protect wildlife and we want to conserve. But what do you do when one species becomes so numerous that it starts to threaten the existence of another species? Then it gets more complicated. And what the Matagi say, say is, well, we're here to help maintain a balance. Uh, we don't want to take more than we should, but... Um, We want to keep up our tradition. And you know in Japan there are problems with deer and wild boar and monkeys and bear also to some extent wandering down into towns and cities and encountering human beings and freaking out and sometimes people get mauled. Well, the answer to that from the perspective of the Matagi is, well, we need to instill and maintain a fear of human beings in the bear and that will resolve these problems. They'll stay where they belong, you know, Mm. and everything will be fine. So how do you instill and maintain the fear of human beings in the bear? The hunt, keep up the hunting pressure. So what I found out and came to understand about them and what I'm really kind of envious about them for is that they are still, they still recognize their place in the ecosystem, whereas we have kind of forgotten that or divorced ourselves or disguised our, our participation in it so well that all our food comes in packages from grocery stores, we don't really have a sense anymore, especially if we're eating meat, that a living thing gave itself basically so that we could survive. They can't escape that recognition. They have to live with it. And I find that admirable. So to get back to your question, though, even though I've been rambling in a rather Mm. long-winded manner, um, are they the Matagi of old, like subsistence hunters? Uh, No. Um, Hunting is more or less a weekend activity, and only during certain times of year. 
And so if you're talking about bears, then you're talking about maybe two or three weekends per year where the time is just right to engage in that activity. Um, but that short period of time is probably the most important time in their entire year. And so in terms of their own self-identity and in terms of their consciousness, and again, their veneration of the Amanokami, that's still very prominent among them. But they're all living in nice houses and have flat screen TVs and talk on cell phones and have all their modern conveniences. It's not a subsistence-oriented lifestyle anymore. When you say they, um, uh, is it a, a set group of people or can people become matagi? Uh, join in their groups? So how, how, what, is, what is the day of the Matagi? Well, that's a good question, and, and it becomes an increasingly interesting question. Um, traditionally, no, you would have had to grow up in a village where there are Matagi present and probably into a Matagi household. And even then, you, it wasn't going to be assured that you yourself would become a Matagi. But these days, since their numbers are dwindling and they're very concerned that their, their tradition is, is, you know, it's in real danger of fading out entirely. Mm -hmm. And so when you're in that situation, you become less adamant about outsiders um, right. coming in. And, and, and so they're opening up. Um, so maybe you don't have to have been born in this area. Um, and traditionally, Matagi were exclusively men. That's starting to change, too. That was my second question. <laughs> yeah. Well, I saw this in Furukawa as well. Mm. Um, you see that, okay, women all of a sudden are participating in these Mikoshi processions, processions of the portable shrine, and they're helping to carry the Mikoshi. Um, that used to be taboo for women. But see, now women are starting to participate. But that's not necessarily a a reflection of a more enlightened attitude. It might be simple necessity in that we don't have the manpower anymore to carry this heavy object. We have no, we, we can't be as choosy as we once were. Mm. And you see that to some extent among the Matagi as well. I was just up in, in one of these uh, traditionally Matagi villages, uh, and uh, it's a village that's now down to about 20 households. And uh, very difficult to continue to live there in the sense that, well, my ho host household, the eldest son, had to commute two hours to go to high school one way because there was no local high school anymore. Uh, that's one way. So that's, that's a pretty major uh, sacrifice to make to continue to stay in this village. So the fact is people would like to stay, but they're sort of being forced by circumstance to move elsewhere. And the uh, villages themselves are kind of dying out. Well, uh, just the other day I met this young man who had just graduated from a university in Tokyo and decided to move and take up residence there. Okay. And I was uh, watching him being taught how to skin and butcher a bear. Um, and he was in there, hands-on. Uh, he was trying to do everything that you know, they were doing. And uh, I'm, it's going to be interesting, you know, will he persist? Will he get burned out after a few months? I don't know. But it's interesting that the attempt is being made and also that he's being welcomed. And it's not going to be easy for him. Mm. But uh, again, um, times have changed, and uh, you know people can no longer afford to be so choosy about who they let in to pass on their tradi tradition. Now that you're studying this uh, matagi, um, have your ideas changed about? the relationship between the Japanese people and, and nature or the ideas of the environment? Well, uh, I guess, you know, I started out by saying I was kind of disillusioned when I first came to Japan and found that they were almost as bad as Americans uh, at spoiling their <laughs> environment. <laughs> and it was a bit of a shock for me. But I should say now, after working with the Matagi, that that initial uh, admiration has kind of been reinstilled because um, the Matagi are people who do 
have a great respect for nature and feel themselves a part of it, don't feel themselves divorced from it at all. And I, I kind of, in a roundabout way, uh, you know, ended up back where I started in, you know, finding, uh, I guess to me, I shouldn't say this because it blows this guise of objectivity that we sometimes try to maintain, but um, uh, I found the Matagi to be models for us to emulate in some ways. I mean, there's a difference between the ideal and the actual behavior, and human beings usually don't measure up to the ideals, but the ideals are still important to guide our behavior, and uh, I think that's what uh, the Matagi represent to me. There's a lot of talk about, um, especially in Japan, you hear the phrase, shizen to kyosei suru, or shizen to kyozon suru, so coexist with nature, mm. coexist with nature. But what does that mean? Mm. Um, it's very interesting. There's a, a religious studies professor at Kyoto University uh, named Yama Ori Sensei, and his idea is that we shouldn't talk about kyosei suru to coexist with nature. He, he uses the term kyosei kyoshi, so coexist and co dying. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. if you still recognize that you are tied up in this network of relationships we call an ecosystem, then you'll recognize that you're not just feeding on other creatures, but one day they will be feeding on you. You could even see plants in a way as consuming animals after the animal body has perished and returned to the soil. Even people who get cremated, you know, they're being consumed in a way by the fire, but also their nutrients being recycled. So the Matagi are people who still recognize that they are definitely part of the local ecosystem and that they have a very important role in maintaining it. Um, and so in that sense, uh, my my uh, confidence has been restored to some extent. Um, uh, that has changed. And also, you know, I, I was really kind of anti-hunting anti for most of my life. Um, and, uh, you know, I was brought up in this con kind of environmentalist attitude. I would still consider my myself an environmentalist, by the way, but um, if we're talking about protecting pristine wilderness, I think that's an admirable goal, but the fact is it's very little of it still exists. And certainly where we find it, we should protect it. But if over 99% of the earth is no longer pristine, then what are we going to do about that? And so this, this is where I see um, this other model. Uh, model of yes, uh, playing a role and you know human beings interacting with the environment, but doing a good job of it. Uh, those are the kinds of models that we need, um, and even even examples that prove the opposite. So negative examples, positive examples, we can learn in either case from them. So. I think um, the research has helped me to understand how naive I was in my thinking about nature. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm interested in this question again. If we don't really have to kill and consume animals, then why should we persist? And I'm starting to come around to the notion that, you know, this is a gift that is offered to us by nature. And unless we accept it, then we're not maintaining that relationship or that contract between us. And I, I hope that I'm not uh, being blasphemous by drawing this connection, but I'll just throw it out there. When I think of the Matagi and their attitude toward animals, a phrase comes into my head and it's, here is my body given for you. And that is sort of the attitude they have when they consume a bear or some other animal that they've killed. So when you're consuming an animal, um, you're happy to have the food and you're probably enjoying it, but you're also remembering that, you know, a living creature gave itself for you. So there's a little bit of, of uh, well, a sense of indebtedness. Mm. And I think that 
Well, without that, what puts limits on our consumption? But if we have that sense of indebtedness, then probably we're going to draw the line. We've had enough. We don't need any more than this. So that's where I think this is, it becomes a sort of a rudimentary conservation ethic. I asked Scott if he felt that this conservation ethic was one of the most important aspects to emerge from his research. Well, certainly one of them. Uh, there are lots of interesting ideas that are coming out of it, but yeah, that would be one. Maybe the most, yeah, maybe the most important one. Mm. I don't know, I'm, I'm very interested in animism. Um, and within anthropology, animism is all too often kind of dismissed as a, a sort of a, a primitive and superstitious belief system, maybe not so much by anthropologists, but by the general public. Mm -hmm. But I've come to see animism as a truly enlightened perspective. Um, mm -hmm. Animism being the idea that there's this conscious presence in nature, and nature is looking back at us, and nature expects us to behave in certain ways. So it's no longer a matter of us uh, being responsible for nature and feeling like we have to protect it and so forth, but being responsible to nature. In other words, we have to play our part. We have to uh, make sure that we're not abusing the privilege. So that, that unless you have this sense of, a, of nature as a conscious presence, then that responsibility to nature it becomes weak or non-existent. And so I see the concept of the Yamanokami, the mountain spirit, mountain god, as, as a form of animism and therefore a rather enlightened point of view. Is there some sort of opposition to what the Matagi are doing from the bureaucratic side, from the governmental side? Well, historically, yes. I, I think, you know, people who move from place to place are always going to be considered somewhat suspicious by the central government because you right. can't keep track of them, yep. especially if they're not engaged in rice production. Uh, then, you know, how are you going to tax them? How are you going to extract their wealth? And they're better able to disguise what they're doing. So there's been that. Um, there's been a kind of a religious, uh, I wouldn't say prejudice, but uh, uncertainty about the Matagi because, again, they consume, kill and consume living creatures, which is a problem for Buddhism and, and even for Shinto in a sense. But it's interesting how the Matagi historically have found ways around that. Mm. And uh, uh, that's kind of a whole different story. Um, but these days, no, I don't think they're certainly not suppressed by the government. In fact, the government, I mean, the, the Japanese government is not a monolith, right? It's a, full of these the various ministries, and they all kind of have their own agenda. Mm -hmm. But the Ministry of Environment is actively promoting or recruiting hunters. Okay. Mm -hmm. They sponsor these little workshops around different parts of the country where mm -hmm. you can go and you can shoot a gun and that type of thing. But it's a response to this recognized need that certain species of animals are becoming too populous now. Um, and, and again, it's not a simple matter of, well, we're into protecting wildlife and we should do that. But what if the wildlife are becoming so numerous that they're uh, threatening these treasured natural stands of vegetation like you find in natural parks? There are just too many of them, too many deer, too many wild boar, whatever. So they're trying to actively recruit hunters to help them. And, and, and they're building up this idea of, I think they borrow the French word, GBA, uh, you know, wild game meat. And, uh, uh -huh. and this is, I, I just went, I was in Tokyo a few weeks ago and went to this restaurant called uh, Ro to Matagi. So I guess the Ro is the um, uh, hot plate that you fry the meat on. But using the word Matagi in there, in there it's the title of the restaurant. Uh, and it's a pretty popular restaurant. But um, so, no, I think, I think the government would be delighted to have more Matagi these days. And they're the, really the only ones that can effectively control animal populations because we're talking about their very own backyards. I've been with them bear hunting, and usually 
when they go out to get a bear, they'll they'll get one because they know what they're doing. Uh, and but but by the same token, they stop when they have enough. Uh, but other people, you know, they'd be wandering around. Very easy to get lost if you don't know what you're doing. Um, by no means not nearly as effective as a matagi would be but the fact is most matagi are in their 50s 60s 70s and um, not very many young people coming in to participate so uh, sadly uh, fading away could you briefly describe your experience bear hunting well, my role is just to tag along and to watch. And, um, you know, uh, the, the Matagi are very kind in, in, you know, including me in their group. But the fact is uh, I can't, I almost can't help but be a drag on them because, you know, I'm, I'm scrambling around along to keep. These are steep slopes. Uh, and, and so you, you know, it's, it's hard to keep up. Let's put it that way. So uh, I'm just thrilled to be out there with them. So I try to keep quiet and I try to be respectful. But my role is is to observe and maybe I can ask a question now and again, but uh, um, basically stay out of their way because when they go into the mountains, they are very serious and uh, they're, they're focused and uh, they're serious about it. So... Um, but it's there again, actual participation really helps me to understand what is involved. And, uh, I, maybe I should use by example, uh, I, I mentioned the connection between hunters and mountaineering. Um, most of the people, uh, in the local mountain rescue corps are Matagi. Mm because they are used to finding their way around in the mountains. They are used to following tracks and signs and things to find the injured person, but they're also used to bringing things back out of the mountains, like a bear that they have shot. Well, they know how to recover the body. That means they're better able at carrying a wounded person, you know, back to safety and help or to rescue or helicopter or whatever. So, uh, you know, they have special skills and knowledge that would be useful in other aspects as well. And I think the government would be well placed to, uh, you know, just just assist them and promote them and protect them wherever they could. Interesting. So they could there could be a kind of a tourism element to it as well as a, a real kind of... Um, uh, health, welfare, and safety element. There is most definitely a tourist element now. Yeah. Uh, ecotourism, and uh, some of the Matagi are leading tours into the mountains, uh, identifying and obtaining, you know, sansai, you know, or, or edible mountain plants, oh, yes. uh, or just appreciating, identifying certain trees, and getting a sense of the ecology and how things fit together, and how everything is connected through a network. Uh, um, increasingly, Matagi are getting involved in these educational adventure tours, I guess you could call them. So, yeah, that's, you know, I, I think even more important in the future. Mm. And a lot of them now manage Minshuku or Ryokan, you know, mm -hmm. places for people to come and stay. And while they're there, you know, sample some of the food and uh, learn something about the local environment. Um you know, so much the better. Mm. So what is the, uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to ask you, what's the next step for this research um, on the Matagi? Where is this going to, where, where would you like to take it? Well, you or, know, I, or, or where is it taking you? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I should also say that, you know, we, we never work in a vacuum and, uh, all these projects that uh, we've been talking about, uh, I've been helped immensely by Japanese scholars who were there working on these things before me. And if you really want to know about the Matagi and you're fortunate enough to be able to read Japanese, then uh, the, there's a, a scholar and author named Taguchi Hiromi, and he's written all kinds of books and articles about the Matagi. 
he's the uh, expert. He's the authority. But the problem for me is, it's not just him, of course. There, there, there are a wide range of scholars that have written about the Matagi. So my dilemma, in a way, is how do I make a role for myself? How do I create a niche for myself when lots of people have been writing about the Matagi and uh, what's left? Well, I think what's left is... Um, for example, if you look at Professor Taguchi, he has been writing about and actively involved with the Matagi for, you know, 20, 30 years. Um, and he's helped them to kind of organize themselves. And uh, he sponsors an annual event called the Matagi Summit, where they get together and they discuss the issues. So he then becomes part of my ethnography because without him, the Matagi might have faded away completely. So I think that's uh, where I come in, kind of standing back and seeing how, uh, you know, scholars and anthropologists are involved in sort of helping or assisting the very communities that they're studying and also how the work of anthropologists is being drawn into the popular media. I mentioned restaurants, but there are comic books and novels and Nike shoes named Matagi. And uh, um, it's, it's, it's just really become a more widespread image. And so I think in the future that becomes part of my role to try to describe all that as well. And also to make a comparison across cultures. I mean, people who are familiar with Native Americans or indigenous people in other parts of the world who hunt animals would be seeing similarities in this consciousness, this sense that nature is a conscious presence and expects us to behave in certain ways and this special... Uh, sensitivity, appreciation for nature. Um, you can find that all over the world. So mm -hmm. there are comparisons to be made. I'm not saying that they're all the same. I'm mm -hmm. just saying there are similarities. And um, I think that that becomes part of my role as well, that how to bring this to a more general audience, right? not just Japan specialists, but, uh, you know, just a general audience. Thanks very much again, Scott Schnell, for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to this edition of Asian Ethnology Podcast. You can download a copy of Scott Schnell's work on Emma Shu in the link provided in the description or go to the Asian Ethnology website at asianethnology.org and find the article in Asian Folklore Studies, Volume 65, Number 2.